everyone. Welcome to our second session of the day featuring Chris Babbitts, where he's from Utah State University, and he's going to be presenting on Can I Really Do What I Want? Creating a Choose Your Own Grading Adventure, an introductory survey. And I'm really interested to hear anything that gives our students choice in the classroom. So I'll pass this off to you, Chris. Hey, everyone. Uh, as Shelly said, my name is Chris Babbitts. I'm a postdoctoral teaching fellow here at Utah State. Um, came here from the University of Texas at Austin, where I earned my PhD in history. But before that, I was at Teachers College and in an EDD program in social studies education. So I've uh, been hoping to try to realize uh, a little bit more student choice in terms of content and assessment in my own history classes. And um, I decided to use the pandemic as an opportunity to envision that and think about it in some more depth. Um, so this is a brand new thing I'm doing in my classroom. This is the second semester. And I do this in my introductory survey class, which is History 1700. And the title of that is American Civilization. So I'm a historian. So I want to just begin with a quote from a historian. Maybe uh, you either know through his books or as the longtime voice of PBS documentaries, David McCullough. He wrote in uh, an essay, it seems to me that one of the truths about history that needs to be made clear to a student or to a reader is that nothing ever had to happen the way it happened. History could have gone off in an, any number of different directions in any number of different ways at almost any point, just as your own life can. You know, I think all of us in the last point, just as your own life can are in that moment and we're, we're always reminded of that. But in the history classroom, oftentimes we fight against what we would call teleology. And this is uh, students thinking that things had to happen a certain way, that things were inevitable. Um, and just as their own lives are not inevitable and we make choices, um, McCullough is saying that that is a cornerstone of history. And as a historian, we actually, we actually have a term for this. We actually have uh, five uh, uh, of terms that kind of guide our teaching. Uh, that begin with the same, same letter. So it makes it easy. So this, what McCullough is actually talking about is something called contingency. Uh, everything is contingent upon something else. Um, but whenever I am designing a class, you know, I go through the, to these five C's of history because these inform uh, my own practice as a historian. And the next one is change over time. Uh, most history classes will teach this and teach this strongly. Causality, context, and complexity. So as a history instructor, uh, no matter what I do in any of my classes, I'm probably hitting on these things. But in order to be an intentional instructor, I have to really think about these and think about making these uh, real goals of almost each and every single thing that I do. So even in something that's going to be a choose your own adventure, there needs to be contingency, change over time, causality, context, and complexity. So I told you that this emerged out of, uh, there's a C theme throughout this, this presentation, by the way, if you're, if you're wondering already. Um, my concerns, uh, I'm a new hire. I'm literally the first one fired too. Uh, it's nice knowing that, um, but where, where you are, I'm the lowest person. So my concerns though uh, are COVID uh, initially. Um, you know, I was hired during, uh, right at the start of COVID for this uh, school year. Uh, my contract's been renewed, so you don't have to think about what I'm doing next year. All of this is not for naught. But COVID was a giant concern, not only for me, but about my students. And so that got me thinking about capabilities, especially students' technological capabilities. But then what happens if they get sick and they're kind of down and out for two weeks? You know, um, what, what would be a way to structure a class where they could either uh, get back up to snuff or maybe not lose much? Uh, in case if they just really couldn't because of COVID long, long haul illness. I was also interested in content interest on their part, content understanding. Then I was also uh, concerned and thinking about how I'd scaffold what I wanted to do. But then all of this uh, could really uh, come crashing down with student stress and anxiety. There's a lot of research about how student stress and anxiety can prohibit them from actually engaging in even the best design course. Uh, so 
anxieties related to uh, not only speaking and answering in class, but fear of being wrong, test taking anxiety added to the anxieties of the pandemic too. Um, but I've never been concerned with covering everything in American history. Um, uh, history 1700 is billed as the survey from the beginning of American history to today. Uh, if anyone can actually do that effectively in 15 weeks, they're a hero. Um, <laughs> I don't, <clears throat> I am not a hero. I don't think I can do that. So I had to think about how to address these concerns, mine and possibly students, in a manageable way so that they, that way they could have uh, an understanding of American history and the historical discipline. So this brings us to really the, the thrust of this, this presentation, which is the concept of choice in a survey classroom. And my first question that I had was, what do students gain when teachers provide choice? You know, what would a, a student like about a class with lots of choices? And so I split this into two kinds of choices. And let's say, well, what happens when students get to select some of what they learn and focus on? We're not talking about uh, a complete free for all um, by any means. Uh, even a choose your own adventure book has different paths, right? So it's not going to be completely they're all on their own and they can just pick and choose. So what, what happens when they get to select some of what they learn and focus on? And then assessment, what happens when students get to select the types of formative and summative assessments they complete? So this is my thought process at the very beginning uh, of putting this together. And this immediately turned into content. What does everyone gain when teachers provide content choices? Because I just started to see what I gained on my end uh, right away. I, I just got, got to thinking about all my years of teaching high school and undergrads and graduate students. And I just saw that this was going to be great for me too. So first, it really helped me focus on my guiding questions for the course. Uh, we might call these essential questions, uh, if you've read anything about understanding by design, but it was uh, an easy opportunity to make content and the questions known from the very beginning. And it also pushed me to touch on a range of student interests. And I was able to use these questions to emphasize change over time. So going back to one of those core history elements. So I thought about it very discipline specific. Um, and so you can see two of these. Um, this is, I have screenshots of my Canvas course, but I'm also gonna go into my Canvas course. Um, so you can see the two that I list because these are the first two we really dive into. One on government and power, which is an enduring theme throughout American history. Uh, and another on economics labor. And all of these questions really focus on change over time. And uh, we're gonna see these a couple times um, throughout this presentation because they are important, not only for me and designing the course, but also for the students. So once again, change over time became something I be became obsessed with. And I ditched how everyone else that I know teaches the history survey. And I said, this class cannot be taught chronologically as a whole. Instead, it needs some kind of internal chronology, a week to week internal chronology, especially if it's going to be online. And so what I did is I structured uh, the course around 10, 10 different themes, maybe nine, maybe nine different themes. And here you can see what a textbook reading looks like when you are just focused on race and social memory as a theme from 1900 to the present. And you can see traditionally we would have had students uh, reading things and trying to make connections across two chapters, there would have been something in between this. But now that they're all grouped together, it's easier for students to see that change over time. And it's easier for students to start making connections across time periods. We're no longer making them have to flip back two chapters or to last week's or two weeks ago's material to make sense of that theme. Doesn't mean that there's not cognitive benefits. Uh, to going back and, and, and making connections. We're going to see how this class does it something different. But, um, but by ditching chronology for the course as a whole, uh, I created this internal chronology for week to week. And I also wanted uh, ultimately to help students start to make some connections. So there are some uh, guiding uh, cheat sheets that connect guiding questions to course material. Um, and so here you can see we're on week six right now. Uh, it's really focused on America and the world. We're kind of in Vietnam, detente, and uh, US influence in the Middle East. Um, so they get 
these connections underneath the guiding question. So I've started giving them uh, entry points into engaging with the material that could seem very overwhelming. Um, I will say one thing before we get into this very far, this is actually not much more than I would have done. Generally, there's no more sources, um, no more lecture hours, nothing like that. So cho choosing their own grading adventure actually hasn't added too much um, uh, of, of the work on their end. So this is what uh, I started already noticing just building the class, is that students were going to engage in a bunch of different cognitive tasks when they were gonna activate prior knowledge a lot because they take, uh, most of them will take US history at some point um, before in their, their life. Um, but I also have structures in place to start making them activate some prior knowledge. Uh, they're also going to then cycle. Their mind is going to have to connect uh, maybe race and social memory to some of the other themes. But as we go back in time, say to 1790 and start over again, they're going to have to make some of those connections of what was happening in the 1830s to women with African-Americans. And we're gonna see how that makes sense. They're gonna have to retrieve information from a bunch of different sources. And um, the next step to, for me was to think about what Lev, Lev Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development, which is finding the balance point and learning challenges. So like most people with a PhD in their content, I'm super comfortable with content and then making it come together in assessments oftentimes is, is the challenge. And once again, uh, I started to see how with assessment, and remember this is a choose your own grading adventure. Uh, I, told, I always tell them it's not a choose your entire own adventure, um, history adventure uh, course. I started to see that everyone is going to gain something when teachers provide assessment choices. Uh, and what I did from the get-go is I wanted this to be a more positive understanding of their grade than the you lose points. And students might always talk about losing points, but I wanted it to be more positive and I wanted it to be build and earn. And I wanted to give them many different paths and options uh, in order to build and earn enough points to earn a 93 in the course. Uh, here you can see a Canvas page I created that where we might see uh, where it clearly says 93 points is an A. And I actually gave them five different optional paths. And then the last one says, but you can build this however you want. So positivity, I want to grade positivity. The lowest stakes uh, grading that I have in, these, uh, in this course is quizzes. And I've attached quizzes to now my lectures. I did not have quizzes to my lectures last semester. I have them attached to them now. And views have gone up by about 100 to 150 students. <laughs> so uh, quizzes attached to lectures get students to watch your lectures. That's just something to very much know. Um, you know, no matter how many times you say, you know, this is just would have been expected of you if we were in an online setting, if you could come to class, all 200 of us. Um, and if there's a quiz, they will do it. Um, but the, th the, the great thing about these quizzes, and I'm not a big quiz person, uh, never have been, but they provide immediate feedback to students, which they need, but also gets them opportunities to earn points. And almost for a lot of them last semester, they said it was almost like a video game for them. Uh, they wanted to earn points and so many more actually went over the minimum or the maximum that I'll count for the final grade. I will only let 50 points from quizzes count towards the final grade, but I encourage them to take every quiz with everything they engage with in order to see if they understood the material. I actually give them two opportunities to take every quiz too, so that way they, if they got something wrong, they can go back and they can check it and then they will understand the material a little bit more. The idea behind this is to build confidence. Uh, we're also in a point in time where I think um, being very uh, stringent with points would, it's just not my style. Um, so um, I've told them, sometimes half of life is showing up. So they showed up, they got half more, a little more than halfway to the A. The next step, and this is a little bit more challenging, is we do use an online discussion board through Packback, which is uh, does cost a little bit of money for the student, but it works much better. And uh, this asks students to ask their own course-related question. 
uh, that engages with history. So this is actually an anonymous one. I made an anonymous one. And this is from this week's stuff. And the student asked the Port, Port Huron statement, hits on how work should be fulfilling, how and why has work become more about making as much money as possible and will it ever be different? And this is a theme that's in the source. And this is something that I think the student would have thought about generally, but the source made them think about it a little bit more deeply um, and they've engaged with that. But I've actually incentivized these online discussions, which are informal for the most part, but they have opportunities for students to link to sources with what I call power ups or bonuses. And these are Super Mario Brothers themed power ups. So a mushroom, uh, if you remember Super Mario, a mushroom makes you bigger and stronger, uh, is worth one point. Uh, a flower is worth three points and a star is worth five points. And these students uh, who earn these power ups can apply this uh, to their grade. So if they got uh, a lower grade on something else, uh, they can ultimately use these power ups. And what they can use those are on are the main written assignments for the class. And students have, uh, so I just wanna say before I go on, these are weekly, these are worth one point. Quizzes are uh, generally have tons of quizzes every week, each worth one point as well. So if they just do pack back and quizzes and they do, they maximize their quiz grade and their pack back grade, they're already at 64. So they have already earned credit for um, the course um, for their, their general ed requirement. I believe it's a D. Um, now to go further and to excel in the course, they have to do history specific stuff. And the first one is a primary source reading grid. And they have three opportunities to hand in this. And this is an analysis of a primary source and putting in conversation with other course sources. Um, so this is what historians would do in their work when they're reading a primary source. They have to identify the who, what, where, why, the argument and the significance of it. And I created these worksheets, which I will not uh, show all of, to really focus on those three Cs again. But the important thing to know is that the assignment culminates with the guiding question. They have to answer the guiding question at the very end. So this guiding question becomes something that the students, uh, if they had forgotten about it, hadn't looked at the cheat sheet, well, they have the cheat sheets again to go back and start making some of those connections and having some of that support. Uh, students who struggle a little bit more with the class actually really like the primary source reading grid because it gives them a little bit more concrete grounding in something. The assignment that's the most fun and that students I think who, who actually operate a, a little bit of a higher level and are more engaged with history, do a history main. And like uh, the primary source reading grid, they have three opportunities over the course of the semester to make, explain and analyze a meme. And once again, they have to focus on these three or these five C's of history. Um, and this is, you know, the applying knowledge. This is, uh, they, they, they get really good with these. Um, some of them really make me laugh. Uh, and I, I make them and post them in pack back. So this was one that I, I posted uh, recently. But once again, the, the analysis of this ends in the guiding question. So the guiding questions are, are key for them throughout. So if you're thinking about, um, you know, they have an opportunity to get 30 points if they just do the three memes, another 30 points uh, if they do a primary source reading grid. You're starting to see how there's a lot of opportunities for the students to earn points, which is, which is what this is about, is creating enough opportunities for students. Another one that I have, and this is, I mean, I will be honest, this is more for me than I think students because I missed talking to, I, I knew I would miss talking to students. So I created a book club. Uh, and it looks very different last semester than this semester. Um, but there's now three opportunities to talk about and analyze a history book with a professor. Um, so the first uh, five weeks has one option, the next five weeks has another, the last five weeks has another. So here is the last option, which is an edited collection called Historians on Hamilton, how a blockbuster musical is restaging America's past. Um, so I actually stuck with everything around the founding generations. Uh, this is not maybe a title I would normally use with my historian colleagues, but this is a marketing uh, uh, method to get students more interested uh, in, in this. And I don't cover as much around the founding as I could. So this book club is an option for our students who are interested in that, 
more than the, some of the other things to get points. And once again, this is a 10 point thing. So a student could conceivably uh, read all three books, do pack back 50 points of quizzes and get an A. So uh, I'm sure you're probably wondering what the heck this could possibly look like in, in Canvas. I don't know if you all have Canvas, but I will, um, I will show you what just what my course looks like and i put it in student mode so we should be perfectly fine with so we have something called design tools um at utah state and emerge from utah state so um so this is what our front pages can look like um the one downside of this is ultimately that there is a lot of um of a choose your own adventure is that there's a lot of explanation. And if we're in that point uh, where students are asking us questions that are clearly answered in the syllabus, um, you know, this, this is a downside and I'll let you know that. But the upside of this ultimately is you can create a course that one, so here's Michelle Foucault. I do teach about Michelle Foucault in my intro class, which makes a lot of my students uh, scared at first, but um, I clearly tell them what they're learning. Then they go straight to guiding questions. Then they have lectures. Then they have textbook reading, their TED Talks. It seems like it can go on and on, but students after the third week say that they get used to it because everything's always in the same order. Everything's always labeled. We do have a tough book in the course, um, but we kind of scaffold towards that. Um, and I tell them to just kind of go through this and try to do two things on Monday, do two things on Tuesday, to do the next two things. And they work their way through their, their list, um, which tends to, tends to, to work. But um, you need to have generally a good number of options uh, for students to engage in. Um, so you'll see that sometimes uh, there's seven quizzes a week plus the lecture quizzes. Uh, sometimes there's even more than that. Um, you know, there's eight quizzes in this week. Uh, one, one week on race and social memory has a lot on slavery resources and sources. So that one I believe has about 15 quizzes. So overall, I created 130 quizzes so far um, for this course to, to create um, that. So that's just kind of generally what it looks like. And any student who's kind of methodical will go through the page and, and keep track of it. Um, I always talk for um, a little too long. So that's just what that kind of generally looks like and I can answer questions. But in the end, when students come to me and they said that they've been struggling, this is actually the point, the take home point that I have with them, which is history could have gone off in any number of different directions in any number of different ways at almost any point, just as your own life can. It's like, okay, you weren't able to focus for this week. How, how do you actually uh, correct? How do we make those connections? Can you go back and watch a couple lectures? You know, this is part of, of the process. It's almost like a uh, human contingency in, in action on their part. And these kind of are the challenges, I think, if you are interested in thinking about this and doing this is, uh, one, how can you scaffold the grading adventure so that lower point assessments like quizzes build student confidence to complete higher point assessments like a history meme? And how do you construct a grading adventure that emphasizes pedagogical content knowledge? So what is it about your discipline, the skills and content that you want students to know after taking the introductory survey? And what are common myths and misconceptions that students generally have about your discipline? Chris, this is Maureen. I have a question if there's time. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how you manage um, in Canvas in the grades if students, some students are taking some quizzes and other students are taking other quizzes or they're doing different assignments, how do you manage all that in the grades? Yeah, I, I have, and I set everything up to be points. And then uh, Canvas will add the points. So when you scroll all the way over to the far right, 
you'll be able to see a point total uh, plus a percentage. When I did grading last semester, what I did was I did individual view and I, I kind of scrolled through the students and I just made sure to do the math. Um, myself is pretty easy to do mental math with the 50 quiz points and deducting um, and generally getting it right. But I had my calculator nearby if you know there were weird decimals and whatnot. But it was so, generally not that hard and historians are not known for our great math skills. So I'm assuming you don't set the grade books so that score um, assignments not completed are auto scored to zero. And so if they don't complete an assignment, it just doesn't count it. Is that how you get around that? That's exactly right. Okay, that makes sense. So I think we got at uh, Michelle's. I know Michelle. I love Michelle. Um, I don't. I don't excuse the assignment because uh, because then that would just take too long. I do have two TAs, um, and I technically they could do that. But I do send out tons of reminders that if they don't have something in that that um, area, it doesn't count against them. And that's part of the positive building element. Um, of saying, you know, you're building, we're not subtracting or we're not punishing. Chris, I had a question. Um, so is the idea kind of just to provide options just so that they have that, you know, intellectual freedom of exploring whatever feels right to them? Or did you try to fit certain learning styles or any other theme? Like I noticed one of your screenshots that said, if you like to do more reading or, so how did you sort of come up with the options? Yeah, uh, I think one of the things to realize is that technology provides tons of opportunities, but there's also um, some limitations. Uh, so uh, things like a primary source reading grid seemed very natural. Uh, it's what I have provided in a traditional classroom um, before and will always almost do um, no matter what. Um, the book club, um, I put, you know, if you like reading, uh, this is definitely an option. Um, and for a student who's kind of confused, I'll be like, well, do you like reading and just discussing and paper, writing papers stresses you out? Like, this is a way to write a little bit less and maybe lower your anxiety. Um, so I do have a little explanation of each one. Um, I think the only challenge has kind of been with um, the quiz limit. I think sometimes students get so addicted to earning points, they want it to count for everything. And I do have an explanation that uh, historians can't get their degrees by just uh, taking quizzes. Um, and we need to write and we need to think and we need to think critically about the past so we can understand the present. So I would try to provide some explanations too. Um, I think next semester, I have a bunch of students um, who want to do like TikTok like videos. And so their multimedia goes a little bit more involved like that. Uh, so that might be the only thing I kind of add um, because it can get somewhat unwieldy, I think, in the grade book. So Chris, yeah. are, you, are you saying when you created the assignments, they weren't necessarily evidence-based? Um, techniques that you were going for to meet certain learning objectives and or learning styles? Well, I, I did a bunch of different things um, that, that could get at that. Um, so, I mean, one, one could say, one could arguably possibly only read the textbook and do the primary source quizzes and, and some of the other things and still get an A and never see me or learn from me um, because they hate these lectures and this is what, um, what they're, they're, they're so sick of being talked to through videos on campus. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm not like a person, I, I know I've done two learning circles in the assessment and evidence thing. Uh, these, were, these were discipline specific pedagogical content knowledge driven practices that I knew would provide options and engagement for students. What I'll say is that the five guiding questions really touch on a giant range of interests and students will gravitate towards say the civil rights, um, the civil rights guiding question, maybe more than labor and economics. Um, but I want to always give a range of entry points and it's not that race and social memory is not in the weeks more driven towards economics because it totally is. 
Um, and that's a way to give entry point for student interest, but there's not like a, I can now point to a, a exact study that said to do this. I will, uh, for Colette, uh, I use something called atomic assessments. And uh, for some of the resources, um, for some of the resources that are embedded underneath, for some of them, uh, they're in a different page, but I give guidance for students to open up that different page. I tell them to always read the questions first, so that way they know what they're reading or listening for. Um, uh, not every student does that. <laughs> so uh, I will always tell them like, this is, this is telling you what to read for main ideas. I keep them um, focused on uh, main ideas and I don't have minutia um, as much as possible. Maybe you're the one that's gonna write that paper, that book, Chris. <laughs> I, I gotta write I gotta write the first book first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have from Michelle Burroughs, how does this choice look in Canvas? How do you set up the assignments? Do you excuse students from the assignment that don't choose to do it and show up as missing? So we we kind of hit on that. Um, I can't show you the grade book, obviously. Um, but I can show you what it would look like for students. Um, so I always have the written assignment uh, up on top because then they can see their highest point totals in their own grade book. Uh, and then I have all of the quizzes listed in order up to a certain point. Um, I try to try to do this so that way they can see this themselves. So here you can start to see how it gets uh, long on our end. Um, and then I have their pack back discussions in here and then the founding fathers book club, which a um, few students, um, a few students do maybe five to six students um, do this. And I'll say that this is a great thing because if you are um, craving some student contact and talking to you, these students tend to be super positive and will give you uh, great feedback. Um, and a self-esteem boost if your course is very well organized. Whereas I, it, you know, most of us, I think, are getting a lot of um, student questions that if they're, they've been answered could be frustrating or students, well, one line, like, I don't know how to do this. Um, so this is a good like barometer for how things are going. These students are not always the, the most well um, kind of motivated. So they're doing this also because there's accountability. Um, so this is a nice one. So this is what this kind of looks like. I'm in uh, student mode. So you can see uh, the individual view for test student. Um, and this is the point that um, we were asked about. It does come up as a percentage and students might ask about that, but then I tell them ultimately to scroll down and look at this point total, not the percentage total. Um, it's about building points and confidence with that. Um, and that is how I will figure that out. So say if this was, you know, different numbers, this was 50 points, the student had earned 85 points out of this and done 10 pack back discussions, they would be at the A and I would just look at the math down here. So that's how I, I do the individual view. It looks very similar. I just scroll down when I click on the next student when I'm inputting the grade or figuring out their grade. And I look at this and I figure out if I need to deduct points for the quizzes, if they went over that. So your quizzes are, are assessed how? Are they auto graded in Canvas or do you look at all of them? I have uh, a couple written ones that I look at. Um, and I have more of those earlier in the semester, so I can troubleshoot um, some issues that students might be having, um, say, talking about what they, or writing about what they want versus the argument of a source. So I do a lot of uh, that more front end, but most of them are auto graded. And Chris, Elizabeth wants to know um, what format you teach this in. This is asynchronous online, but I would say that, you know, uh, upon being fully vaccinated and whatnot, the primary source quizzes and the, some of the, I have TED talk quizzes too, could totally just be incorporated into a class that then will be face-to-face -face as well. So I've created and thought about this in a way that 
uh, can have long-term utility and have students get feedback right away instead of kind of being out in the loop of not necessarily knowing if they understood a source or not. Any last questions for Chris? Because we just hit our time. Well, if you do have any questions for Chris, you can go to the events and start making comments. Chris, if you have any supplemental information or documentation, you can post it there as well. But thank you for being part of the T4L conference. I really appreciated this presentation. And while I think it'd be a lot of work to revamp at the beginning, I think overall, it would have a great impact on my students, especially for my intro geography class. So thank you very much.